Um, so assalamu alaikum everybody. Thank you so much for joining another episode of Coping in Quarantine. Um, as, as you know, you know, the last few days of, of Ramadan are, are closely approaching the last 10 days, most exciting. Um, and I really want to hear from you. I want to hear about how, you know, COVID has impacted your normal traditions when it comes to Ramadan, what you're doing to prepare during this time, um, even traditions that you, you grew up with. Um, please, please feel free to reach out to us at hello at impact.org or on any of our social media. Um, mention it in the chat boxes, comment below. We really wanna uplift some of your stories. Um, so that would be phenomenal. Um, I think that being said, uh, I think that, sorry, I think that a common theme during this time um, has been giving. And so with one of our hosts, um, with one of our guests, Imam Khalid Latif from ICNYU. Um, we are so, so excited to have him on tonight. Um, and I'm going to pass the mic over to our president, Mr. Salam al Mariyadi, to kind of get the ball rolling. So, Salam alaikum, Khalid. How are you feeling? Salam alaikum. Doing well, alhamdulillah. How are you, Salam? Fine. Uh, how's Ramadan in, uh, amidst uh, COVID 19 and in. Uh, in, uh, in what I thought, I think, uh, you know, can be viewed as a way the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, he, he prayed on his own uh, many a time, and uh, I, I'm, I'm actually enjoying it. How about you? Uh, yeah, it's been a very different experience, to say the least. I think the solitude is definitely an opportunity for a lot of reflection, um, but the backdrop of the pandemic makes it yeah. that much, you know, more real, I think, in different ways. Yeah. That's that's so true. Well, tell us, uh, you know, you, you're in the in the in the place, the epicenter in in, in New York uh, for for this pandemic. And how is the community handling the situation and the level of fear and um, and and at the same time relief? What what's the picture look like from your standpoint? I mean, New York City is in a in a pretty tough space to say the least. Uh, the realities around just the sheer number of people getting sick, a uh, number of people passing away. Um, the community that I'm blessed to serve uh, at the Islamic Center at NYU, uh, we estimate our total community inclusive of students is about 10,000 people. And we have gotten word of uh, at least 75 people who have either passed themselves or who have mm -hmm. lost loved ones just in our given community. Um, the average number of janazas taking place uh, for funeral homes has been anywhere from 15 to 30 a day. Uh, and that's just a percentage of the overall number of people in New York who have uh, lost loved ones who have passed themselves, let alone the impact from uh, inadequate healthcare coverage, uh, job loss, uh, and so many other things that are, are rendering a lot of opportunity and openings for people to come out and support one another right now. That, that, that's incredible. I, I, I didn't realize it was at that pace uh, of, uh, of loss of life. Um, I mean, here we'd be, you know, we, we, we may know one person who knows one person that passed away or was afflicted with the, with the virus, but not to that extent. It sounds much more devastating in New York City than anywhere else. I mean, I think, you know, Michigan comes in second after us. I did a webinar for some people out there recently. And it's not to take away from the subjectiveness of the loss of life and the struggles that people are going to. Um, but New York City is just exponentially higher in pretty much every place that you can think of uh, in terms of just the impact that it's, it's been facing since this, this all started. Well, for those coming to you and sharing an overwhelming amount of grief or sadness or depression, what's the message you share with them? You know, the work that I do, I try to teach people and reach them individually. Uh, they all have their own perspectives and uh, their own respective strengths and non-strengths. Um, the grief that we're facing right now is also just a very unique circumstance because you want to conceptualize somebody passed away there's restrictions on the funeral home as well as the burial ground in terms of how they can be buried and how many people can be there for the burial. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a strong likelihood that their family members were not able to be present. So the grieving loved ones 
who have lost a relative are now in a sphere where they couldn't pray over the deceased. You then have individuals who prior to their loved one passing away likely couldn't have been with them in the hospital to share their last moments because of restrictions going into the hospital as a visitor. Uh, and then there's a strong chance that that person who couldn't go to the hospital or to the funeral also contracted COVID-19 from the person who died from it. And the ability to find people around them to grieve with becomes further limited because they can't expose somebody to the virus. And so it's a moment right now that we're stressing to people uh, that you want to check in on people. You don't want to undermine the deep impact that a phone call, a text message, FaceTime, Zoom can have, where you are going out of your way to let somebody know that you're thinking about them, that they are important enough that you don't have to wait for them to reach out to you. Uh, and you know, we have this in our tradition where the Prophet Islam, he tells us that even smiling can be a charity. And mm -hmm. to deepen our understanding of that within moments where there's a lot of room for individuals to find direct impact from this pandemic, uh, let alone so much opportunity for indirect impact, to cultivate within our broader network an opportunity to say, hey, you need to pick up the phone, reach out to someone. Uh, we've also been trying to offer closure to people uh, by creating opportunities for communal du'as, um, prayer gatherings where in the absence of virtual ritualistic prayer, you know, the janazah prayer can't be done, the Jummah prayer can't be done. Uh, we're doing over the course of the week um, an adaptation, for a lack of better words, to the current circumstance where I'll write a prayer out in English uh, on a certain theme, wisdom, mercy, forgiveness, uh, etc. Um, we'll mention the names of people who are sick or who have passed away uh, and create an opportunity for everyone to collectively come and still offer some kind of prayer for them and for their loved ones um, to, to help with the grieving process. So it's so important that your center, the Islamic Center of New York, is there still as the point uh, of connecting community, even though physically uh, you all cannot be there together. Well, physical separation doesn't have to necessitate spiritual disconnectedness. And I think the beauty of our tradition is that its emphasis has never been just purely on externals, but it understands the necessity for relating that which is outward to that which is inward. And where you can have connections, not on shared externals, race, ethnicity, class, cultural heritage, country of origin, uh, but you have a uh, connection on shared internals, shared hearts, shared values. It enables you to now still be with someone without being physically present. And I think with modernity, we see such advancement in technology and the ability to be interconnected is unlike any other time in the world. It's not to say that being with someone physically wouldn't be amazing, but to be able to understand that the opportunity to think creatively and to still maintain connection uh, that transcends at times what we limit our understanding of being connected to and just drawing upon our tradition to see where that can be rooted in real principles of love and compassion and mercy um, that are connecting people from within and not necessarily from uh, something that exists outside of them. And w what about people now, what's your advice to people who need to go to work for, to make a living, but know very well that once they step out, they are taking that risk. Uh, they, they could be infected and, and suffer a severe consequence. Um, how, how do we deal with, with many within our community, many within our society that cannot afford to stay home for too long? It's hard. I mean, in New York City, you know, where people think that the streets are empty and there's not real consciousness, you can take pictures of pretty much every subway line that leaves from Manhattan and goes to the outer boroughs, and it's packed to the brim, usually with people of color, uh, and the gross majority being Black people of color. 
And I think one of the things this pandemic has shown to us is a very overt revelation of how race and class still dictate so many things. The ability to speak, I think, is not necessarily what people need right now. But I think what people need right now is an empathetic mode of listening, both for themselves individually, as well as for the person who does not have a choice but to go out and perform certain tasks, not just in the frame of ensuring that people's lives are not disrupted who are sitting at home, but mm -hmm. they literally will not be able to feed themselves or their loved ones if they do not go to work because they don't get paid if they don't get to work, let alone having no health benefits from the job that pays them only when they're at work. And they're doing this in the backdrop of rent that they still have to somehow pay, other bills that they somehow have to pay. And I think in modes like that, our natural reaction is to talk before we listen and to be in a sphere where we then relate things to our own experiences. And there's so many people who will simply not understand what it means to not have a choice about going out into the public arena and to confront this day to day and risk not just exposing yourself, but then everybody who's back home to expose them as well. And to just be in a sphere where it creates a learning opportunity, where you are not able to learn anything if you're not listening. And if you're the one that's talking, then it's not possible for you to listen. And so for me, I think where I see support coming in is to enable people to have a space of self-expression, to let them vent and put out some of the heaviness that they're carrying, to know that I'm gonna carry some of it with them so that they don't have to walk with it on their own. And then what we've done at our Islamic Center uh, is create a bunch of different campaigns um, to help provide financial support to people who are in need. Because a $1,200 stimulus check, if you actually are somebody who gets it, is not gonna go very far in New York City, regardless of what part of New York City you live in. And so we've been able to, since the beginning of the social distancing, um, I think to date, we've raised about $1.3 million, alhamdulillah, um, from thousands of people to provide support to people who are in financial need, who are lacking basic necessities. Uh, and I think the blessing of that comes from the community at large jumping in, because it's thousands of people giving $10, $50, $100, but digging deep and believing that their individual gift will make a difference and collectively they can be a force to provide hope, real strength to people uh, at a time when governmental apparatus is not doing what it should be doing. And we step up to do what we can do just because it's the right thing to do. Is there anything else people can do beyond financial giving? Yeah, definitely. I think right now is the time for people to be staying at home I can't speak to every individual state and city's experience, but I could tell you being in New York City where every single day for however many weeks I've had somebody I know pass away, that the reality is such that we can't think about this in an egocentric framework. And the admonition to stay at home does not mean that that becomes a final step, but then you utilize your time at home to think out who and what you are going to build with and what you will build um, to assess what kind of needs will be there three months from now, five months from now, 10 months from now. The impact on economy, the revelation of just every system that we have in place from healthcare to the prison system, to the educational system, to pretty much every part of federal government being in a sphere where it is indicating that there is a lot that needs to be remedied and fixed. If you're thinking of things to do, in New York City where we live, you see at 7 p.m. every single day, Eastern time, the streets are filled with people clapping and yelling and showing gratitude for first responders and doctors who are putting themselves out there in ways that I wonder what kind of faith they're built with that every day they get up to meet this again. In my community, we've had four doctors who have passed already 
who contracted the virus while they were serving patients, knowing that it was potential risk for them, but all they wanted to do was heal people, right? May Allah make them from the shuhada. They're amazing right. individuals doing what they could. Those people who go out to clap for our healthcare workers and our first responders, if in those few minutes that they did that, they also just picked up the phone, they called their electives, their representatives, legislators, said to them, why are we putting the sheer amount of money that we're putting in to things that go into weaponry overseas? Why are we putting it into what we're doing and we're not equipping our first responders with adequate health equipment, safety equipment? We're not putting it into things that we need on the ground right now. It would likely have that much more impact. Other things that you can do at home that don't necessitate money uh, is you can pick up the phone and call people who you know are already alienated in your community. The Ramadan, especially for many people, uh, they're not able to fast and it's already a difficult experience for them. In our community, we've been doing virtual iftars and next week we're gonna be hosting an iftar for people who are just not able to fast because they might have medications for physical wellness, mental wellness, we think about then beyond those who cannot fast, people who are of different racial backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, converts in the community, women who are nursing, pregnant, the elderly, individuals who typically might not find space within a given community who right now are on their own. What is it like for people who are living in homes with abusers? What is it like for people who are living at home with their families who don't know that they're Muslim? What is it like for the elderly who don't have young people in their lives who are looking after them? And a five minute phone call can be a real source of strength and invigoration. You just wanna think about how you shift the paradigm and you're not myopic in a perspective, but you say, I tap into my own creativity. I tap into the networks of my friends, my family members, and we answer the question of what we're going to do and build right now so that we can be a source of hope for people in the world and not the reason that they have dread in it. You know, what, one of the campaigns we're launching is the human security campaign. And, you know, our, our federal budget is about $1 trillion a year just on national security, which is mainly military, hard power, policing, surveillance. Um, but we don't think enough uh, in terms of, you know, when, when, when the Quran talks about security, it's, it's about making the individual secure, making people secure, which is really what human security is. It's people security. Um, what can we advocate for then, you know, for those of us who are not in New York City, what, what can we advocate for in terms of that human security, which is health security, which is economic security, which is employment security? Those are things that I think are important to, to, to bring resources uh, to the front lines in New York City and to protect our, our frontline people, the, the, all the healthcare workers and essential workers. Look, I think every single thing that you just highlighted in terms of individual security is something that needs work on. But to be able to address it necessitates understanding that we can't deal with just symptoms. We have to get to the crux of what the actual issues are. These systems are not necessarily broken. These are systems that are actually doing what they were built and intended to do. The idea to create a system that privileges a majority demographic, that checks off certain boxes of privilege and enables that privileged demographic to continue to maintain what it does in terms of its own power and its own need at the consequence and expense of minority demographics and where and how we want to start thinking about. Like literally in our country in the last week, who is it that has been killed that the government could care less about? And who is it that continues to die that the government could care less about? In New York City, the number of people who are black and Latino have died at twice the rate as people who are white. You look at cities across the country, the overall population demographic tends to be in the 10 to 20% of people who are African-American, but they tend to be 60 to 80% of those who are 
impacted, passing away, contracting the virus. There seems to be not a care about individual experiences that stem from prisms of race and class. And until those constructs are dismantled within the processes and systems and structures, you're gonna see it perpetuate itself in every which way possible. A young black man can be jogging in Georgia, 25 years of age, and gets shot point blank. And not only is that atrocious in and of itself, but it perpetrators can sit for two months and nothing happens to them consequently. And it's not that things didn't happen because there wasn't evidence, but they had the video and the only way that they acted wasn't after they saw it, it was after the rest of us saw it. So how do we start to do things? I think we don't fit into an acquiescent mode of what a good minority, mad minority is. But one of the most American things that you can do is to not ally yourself to uh, any particular administration, but you utilize your voice and you speak out against inequity in all of its forms and address what its source is. Right now, if there's not like anything that indicates that we need to have a better healthcare system for people, uh, I don't know what else people need to understand and what they would need to see. If we don't see where there's a need and a necessity for people to have access to just basic forms of income, to think about what and how they are able to do to get through the course of their days. Uh, and I would say to also understand really overall how we have created realities that are rooted in policies that stem from the systems that sought to stratify us from slavery to Jim Crow to mass incarceration that has segmented populations in particular demographics within locales on local state and national experience that has minorities in spaces that they are particularly more vulnerable than other demographics but until it starts to be that people in general are not seen as just liabilities in this and they're factored into a cost benefit analysis that it doesn't matter if they die like they literally have gotten on television and said we are going to open up states because the only people who are likely to die are the people who are compromised in their immunity and are elderly and that's crazy to fathom that you can have such utter disregard for life but if you are then the one that's dictating policy and that policy trickles itself down and the people who are in a space where they are the minorities impacted by that policy somehow also have to live through it and voice themselves what the impact is, how, are that, how is that gonna change? With people who possess privilege, who possess power and elements of it create coalitions and collaborations and they start to get as angry about the impact that is taking place upon minority demographics as angry as the people who are impacted themselves. When their outrage reaches that level, despite the fact that they're not impacted, then you'll start to see. And I think what people like you and I can do is that we continue to speak, we continue to share narrative, we continue to share experience, that impact does the amazing work that it does to interject itself within the political arena, within the media sphere, to influence how narrative is built out and starts to share stories and continues to share with individuals who are of influence, of power, so that they start to be hearing our story from us and not from someone else. And as we move forward, the spheres of influence increase and it'll diminish the inequitous practices that take place. There's just not any one thing that you could say, this is the focus. No, no, you're right. There's, but, the, there's just issues that are rooted in supremacy and anti-blackness, race and class at the core of every system you could think of that has to be broken down. And we read in the Quran every night how our, the purpose of our faith and our being is to bring equity and, and to remove these inequities and right now, you articulated very eloquently the inequities within the whole healthcare system and 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 beyond actually in, in our whole there's system. people man there's doctors that i know salam whose patients have said to them 
as they're about to get intubated, they're on their way and they say, don't intubate me. First, tell me how much this is going to cost. Yes. Because they're more worried about the expense to them having inadequate healthcare coverage rather than the worry of what coronavirus is doing to them physically. That's like the extent of the physical impact alone, the sheer psychological impact the system has on people who are not benefiting from, from any of it. Incredible. That's incredible. Um, what about the testing that's supposed to take place? And, you know, they're supposed to be now testing and tracing and, um, uh, and isolation. You know, the communities that we come from do not trust the, the federal government. I don't know how many, I don't know who trusts the federal government at this time. But how do we work with communities and community health clinics? Because that's a public health necessity amidst all this suspicion and fear. It's hard. It's long. I mean, look, I, I worked as an inspector for the NYPD for 11 years. I was a department chaplain. I had a high rank of an inspector. I've done a lot of work with various levels of government from city to state. Not anything with this federal government, but the prior federal government met with Obama, his intelligence agency, State Department, etc. I've still, in the course of all of that, had the FBI visit me in my home on numerous occasions. When I've asked them, what is it that you really want from me? They say, you're just too good to be true. Know that we're watching you. Getting on and off of planes is not a fun experience, to say the least. The realities of being detained, surveilled, profiled, I could tell you in deep detail. And that's with somebody who has my connections. I've shared stages with people like the Pope and the Dalai Lama and been interviewed by Stephen Colbert and Katie Couric and other things. What do you think is happening to people who don't have those connections? And so to understand the chilling effect that policy has, but also the suspicion is warranted that if we were to now say, let's let government have access to knowing where you are at exactly what time, and there's not measures in place or balances in place to ensure that this is not impacting those whose immigration status is of a certain kind, who are undocumented, people who might have valid resident status. I have people in my community who are eye bankers that work at prominent banks in Manhattan on Wall Street, and they'll come to me and say, federal government came to see me at my office today, trying to like question them and get them to come to the federal building. So it's not rooted in, and I'm not saying you're saying this, but I think just for people to understand, it's rooted in actual experience. Right. That these are realities that stem because our government does not have the best interest of its citizens on a whole. It, again, caters to particular demographics, and it's willing to retain power and get voted into office at the expense of vilifying and demonizing entire communities of color. Both domestically and internationally, our policy demonstrates a lot of this, that we cater to kind of a swaying approval, and the only thing that it does is ends up killing people that they could care less or are being killed. In pursuit of these conversations, what I think it will necessitate when the testing and the tracing and all of this gets actually put into practice um, are interdisciplinary committees that come together, which is a precedent in our community. The religious scholar is not the only scholar uh, or expert, nor is a religious leader the only leader. Similar to how Fatawa were created on, you know, Janazah prayers and the burial of bodies afflicted by COVID-19 or in the midst of a pandemic. You know, the mufti or the religious scholar would sit down in that instance and yield to what do public health experts say? What do medical professionals say? You know, how does this understood from the prism of the funeral director and from the social worker? But there's an interdisciplinary mode that stems from just our tradition uh, in all of its institutional memory historically, that similarly people like yourself, people who understand the impact on a policy level, people who work within governmental apparatus, people who understand the concerns 
both from the activist standpoint as well as from the standpoint of those who work in security, uh, as well as I would say people who work in mental health, psychology, people who work in various social services sitting at the table and say, for our community, what makes sense? And it might be that a national agenda, you know, is important, but also localized communities will need to figure out what things mean locally. In New York City, the Muslim vote is now a swing vote. And people who are at a city level understand the relationship between the city and the Muslim community in a very different way from Muslim community and national government, for example. And it's likely very different where you are in terms of, mashallah, the connections and uh, you know, the networks you all have built through the amazing work that you do in comparison to somebody who might be in a Muslim community where there's only 200 Muslim families in an entire 100 mile radius of where they are and they have to now yield to more support from a broader collective on a national level to be able to take their cues. Meaning it won't look the same everywhere, um, but no one type of expert is gonna really be able to determine what that strategy is gonna look like. I well, would say people yeah. should start thinking about it now though, especially in the national sphere, that what are we gonna roll out as advice to people um, who are just trying to figure out what they need to do. Well, I just know that the governor and the mayor best consult with you if they want to have an effective program. So really appreciate your, your wisdom and advice on, on, on these important steps forward. Well, thank you for uh, the opportunity to share some thoughts. I appreciate well, it. And, and before I hand it back to Iman, and she has some questions from the audience, I just want to ask you to explain all the great initiatives, you know, the Islamic Center of New York, uh, of NYU, that you lead has tremendous amount of uh, initiatives. And what are some of the other initiatives that you can share with us? I mean, right now, what we're looking to do, uh, we have a, a fund that we've started. It's at launchgood.com, NYC Ramadan Relief. Uh, it's at about $550,000, alhamdulillah, that we've raised in the last two and a half weeks. Um, and the goal with it is to provide financial assistance uh, to people really who just have no basic necessities in, in their life at the moment. Uh, a day or two ago, we did a soft launch on a new campaign um, to provide financial assistance to survivors of domestic violence and abuse um, who right now are either still at home with their abusers and we're trying to help get them out or those who have left um, from abusive homes and need help getting back on their feet. And in both projects, aside from the financial contributions, what we're doing with the caseworkers who are involved from the social service agencies that we're working with uh, is to help leverage our community's talent. Um, so for example, a mother who's single with two sons, teenaged, early 20s, out of the workforce, uh, will give them a grant of about $2,500, um, but also have our community members work with the two young sons on how to write a resume, basic interview skills, um, to create opportunities and processes to get them back on their feet. Prior to this, we had raised funds to assist um, with the escalating number of deaths, uh, and our funds were being allocated to um, funeral homes to increase capacity, provide financial assistance to families who couldn't afford or weren't anticipating the passing of a loved one. Because in the frame of all of this, there was people who were still um, increasing prices unnecessarily. So an average funeral in New York City is gonna be start to finish about $2,000, give or take. There's people who are trying to charge people who have nothing, $10,000 to bury their loved ones, which is ridiculous. Um, and then prior to that, before the stimulus package was put into play, and there wasn't even conversations, we had launched a campaign um, that raised about $600,000 that was on a national level um, to give funds to people who were in financial need. Uh, we're hoping to continue to raise funds throughout the end of Ramadan um, and beyond that to start leveraging our community networks to say, you know, what are the other apparatus that we need to build? Last year, 
we were able to raise about a million dollars in Ramadan to open an emergency confidential shelter um, for survivors of abuse, women and children. And we're hoping, you know, post Ramadan, uh, we had envisioned to have a strategic revisioning sessions um, to say what's the next 10 years look like in terms of clinics, food pantries, et cetera. Um, but we'll likely, uh, you know, fast forward on some of that to say, well, how do we lay the groundwork for it um, so that, you know, we're doing for people what we have the ability to do? Well, God bless you and may God accept all the great work and uh, the fasting and prayers and zakat that you are yeah, performing this month. And your leadership uh, is, is highly valued, Khalid. I'm so glad that we had the opportunity and I hope that our audience is listening and and responding uh, by actually giving uh, to the Launch Good, Ca Launch Good campaign and all the other campaigns that you're doing because it's, it's exactly what we're supposed to be doing in serving humanity. So thank you. And I'll hand it back to Iman for some other questions. Alrighty, the phone is on mute now, so it won't be bothering us. Um, Imam Khal, I want to I want to go back to the the notion of optics during this time. Um, many of our audience members are are a bit concerned by the president's comments regarding the unfair standard of closing churches but keeping masjids open, mosques open. Um, can you share with us how this is absolutely not the case and how? Um, the Muslim community in, in a state like New York is, is really trying to adhere as closely to COVID precautions as possible. Yeah, I mean, I don't know of any messages in New York that have been open for, for really anything, to be honest. Um, aside from the individual reality of not going to our main Friday prayer service of the week, the Jummah prayer, uh, many mosque communities unfortunately aren't even able to afford to, to stay open if they wanted to. Um, there's about 200 mosques in New York City, uh, and a good number of them um, are right now in a lot of financial difficulty, and we're hoping to kind of help galvanize people to support there as well. Um, but across the board, um, every Muslim leadership council in New York City uh, and the rhetoric coming out also from various professional organizations, um, civic groups, nonprofits, for-profits has been to tell their community members and constituents to stay home and be home and to not come together in any type of congregational mode. The only times that you see Muslim organizations really going out and doing things is that there's an amazing number of people who are out there um, providing just food to people who are in need. Uh, they're dropping off groceries to individuals who uh, have to stay at home because they're elderly and they're immunocompromised. And these are not just people who are Muslim that are beneficiaries, but people of all walks of life. There's groups like Muslims Giving Back who have been every night giving out food every day, um, providing food. They literally have street carts set up where individuals can come and just take food, um, no questions asked. Uh, you have a gourmet cafe that's been set up. Um, it's called the Immigrant Gourmet Cafe that's been delivering tens of thousands of meals to first line, front line responders, uh, people who are working against the virus in every which way. Um, individuals who are really just trying to help people in their, their moments of need. But mosques in particular um, for religious services have been closed. A good number have shifted to things virtually, um, but other than that, there aren't anybody, um, you know, who's, and nobody's even trying to really make like an issue about it. They understand that in our religion, the preservation of life um, is the main objective above anything else, uh, and where and how we um, yield to what public health experts say is what our religion would tell us to do. Yeah, and, and so, you know, keeping that in mind, I think one of the, the the scarier things about COVID is that it doesn't seem to discriminate. You know, people of all walks of life, from members of White House staff to, you know, inner city neighborhoods are being impacted by, by the, the pandemic. And so, you know, we see nearly 22 million school children no longer having access to, to school lunches. We see 6 million migrant undocumented workers who are deemed essential workers, but given no part of the stimulus relief package. Um, 
so there's a, an overwhelming amount of need that is that is growing. Um, with that in mind, you know, I, I want to ask if you've seen any kind of solidarity in, in coalition building during this time, be it in interfaith work or be it even with community organizing that, you know, is, is made up of groups or organizations that normally you wouldn't have seen working together. There are. I mean, there's a lot of people who are definitely coming together and connecting in various ways. Uh, I do think some of those coalitions are pre-existing individuals that come together across culture, across race, across religious communities. Uh, and then you see individual religious communities doing a lot of amazing work, um, to say the least. Uh, but, you know, I think the, the, the idea embedded in what you said is where, in fact, the virus shows us um, that it does discriminate right? Because it's giving a revelation of how this impacts those 22 million ch school children you're talking about, or the essential workers who are not able to choose whether they go to work or not. And I think this is the crux of it. There's always been people who work together, mashallah. Like there's always people of good conscience, good value, right? No religion owns love or mercy. No religion owns the idea of going out and serving others as no race or no class or culture is able to say that they more or less emphasize that by any means. The challenge isn't that there aren't people who are coming together. Their challenge is that we don't necessarily recognize the impact of those people who hate the idea of being connected to other people. They would never want to be connected to someone who is of a different skin color than them or connected to someone who has lesser wealth than they do, comes from a different background. And it's not just on an individual basis. The sheer number of groups that do not get amplified in the media where the antagonistic narratives tend to be prevalent or the stories that are gonna be clickbait tend to be, you can walk in New York City and see beautiful things happening every single day, but the revelations are not just absolute in terms of goodness, there's also revelations from this difficulty that show a lot of ugliness, a lot of greed, a lot of selfishness. And the challenge is the power dynamic that exists within those individual groups that could do anything to ensure that they are not connected to people who are different from them. And the biggest variable in their favor are the number of people who have capacity to do that may not adopt the discriminatory prejudicial viewpoints as the group that does not want to be disconnected, but they still sit back and they're not doing anything. Mm -hmm. They're not leveraging themselves as a voter. They're not leveraging themselves as being part of a network. They're not leveraging their skills, their talents to go out. And somebody else is always the one that is going to be the person that they support or they just sit back and they wait till something fixes itself and then they're back in their routines. And if more people started to follow their ideas and kind of their values and their consciousness, and it started to overwhelm the sheer number of people who are out there whose primary motivation is to stay disconnected and not connected. And it's not to be morbid in any way, but they honestly could care less if there are people who are poor and people who are black and people who are undocumented or immigrants who are dying right now it's and it's crazy to maybe like think about but it's true nonetheless and so the counter to that kind of hate is not to meet it with more hate right if you try to meet fire with fire you're just going to make more fire right you got to meet fire with something that extinguishes it. And our deen, our religion, teaches us to remember who, in fact, our teacher was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and to embody characteristics rooted in mercy, compassion, forgiveness. A literal dua that the Prophet makes, alayhi salam, peace be upon him, is, Allahumma kfili qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun, that, O oh Allah, bestow your forgiveness upon my qawm, my people because they don't understand. And the context in which he makes that prayer is at the battle of Uhud, after his face has been pierced and the battle is won by the opposition. They've struck him, killed a lot of people, 
And he's still making dua for the people who are hurting him because his motivation is still one that it's not even about the people. He doesn't want that toxicity of unrighteous anger inside of him. His anger has to be maintained in righteousness that allows for it to not be a vision modifier, but a vision amplifier that then allows for him to still move and do good things. Do you know what I mean? Um, but you know, the, the, the examples that are there are in the thousands of people who are coming together. I think we have to start making examples of the people who don't want to come together and highlight the fact that they are the problem and they're the obstacle in this broader mechanism that's continuing this inequity to, to, to continue. I believe it was Malcolm X who said, we are not outnumbered, we are out, out organized. And so with, with this kind of, with what, with what you're saying, I, I, I um, echo your sentiment in the fact that there are definitely, I think, a greater amount of people who, who do believe in this like more just and equal society. We just have to um, absolutely call out wrong where it is wrong. And um, inshallah, organizations like MPAC and organizations like ICNYU are, are doing a great job of tackling a lot of these. Um, issues. But, you know, I feel like we've, we've had some heavy questions um, in the past little bit. So I want to kind of end on something you said earlier that, you know, you can go out into New York and, and find like beautiful things happening. And, you know, I, I know that you're a husband and a father to two very, very adorable kids. Um, and right now in, in the oddest way, you know, a neighbor dropping off a cake, a friend calling us, a child painting a picture. These are all things that are, you know, really, um, kind of hopeful, building hope in, in for many of us. I, I wanted to ask you if you could share with us something that you've experienced recently um, that, that would kind of uplift, you know, our audience and recognizing this feeling of hope and solidarity during this time. Yeah, I mean, literally this morning, I took my four-year-old out, we were running some errands, uh, and we stopped at a place where the playground is closed, but they still have a track that's open and some other things. Um, and he was on a scooter and he wanted to just go around in the track on his scooter and we were playing tag. Um, and there's a group of people who have set up a table and all they're doing is passing out face masks to, for free to people, not charging any money, five per family, uh, take what you need, no questions asked. And there's lines of people who are doing it. There's literally, as I, I said before, you could go online and probably Google it. There's young people in Brooklyn right now who in Manhattan, you know, and throughout the boroughs, it's really common to see like street carts and food trucks. They have set up an entire street cart that has a line of people of every single background and all they're doing throughout the day, not just at night after iftar time, throughout the day, they're just serving food after plate after plate after plate so that nobody's hungry. They're still creating like this light, this hope. And you know, this is, it's important, right? Like the illustrations that we have, when we think about them deeply, we're not meant to be people who are just looking at things from the most apparent understanding, right? From a vision of our eyes, but we're, aspire to look from a vision of our hearts and to draw meaning and depth from things. When you think about light and the sharing of light, your giving light to someone does not diminish your light ever, right? A candle lighting another candle does not reduce the flame on the initial candle. All it does is illuminate another. And not only is it creating more light for the other, it's also creating more life for yourself because you benefit from the illumination of the other person now. And this is what they're doing with small acts of kindness, small acts of love, saying that within the apparatus we find ourselves in, we're going to still get done what we have the ability to get done. My four-year-old says to me, you know, why are they just giving masks to people? And I said, because they're good people. There's no other reason. And now what we have in front of us is opportunity to really think and really assess on who we want to be because the difficulties, they don't catalyze change themselves, but they create moments of reflection through what they reveal to us. We see goodness, we see wrongness, 
We see how race and class defines who has and who has not. But the most important revelation is going to be how we introspectively say, what have I done in response to any of this? How do I assess what my yesterdays were like so that I can determine if the person I am today is ready to become the person I can be tomorrow and be in a sphere where I say, from all these examples, what do I want to pull from? You know, I told my wife the other day that I have so many students who study to be doctors who should not be studying to be doctors. Their families are forcing them to be doctors. And I said to her, you know, for the first time, I've realized how fortunate we are that all of these people became doctors, even if they didn't want to. And I have never in my life wanted to be a doctor so badly. Because just in thinking of what these people are made of, and if you want to think about like drawing on people's beauty and their light and their goodness, the sheer fact that they are willing to go and do what they are doing, knowing that they will have a potential risk, it epitomizes what like real love and selflessness is. And it's not hard to find, but we don't want to pander to people and we don't want their sacrifices to be valorized, but then be done in vain. We want to take from their examples and say that, you know what? They're doing what they can do. I'm not a doctor, but I'm gonna still get done what I can get done. And even if that's me impacting one heart, then that makes all the difference because I might not have changed the world for everybody, but I changed it for them and they might then go and be the one that changes it for everybody else. And so my four-year-old you know, can benefit from recognizing that a complete stranger is handing to somebody an entire packet of face masks for no other reason other than they know people need it and they're not getting anything in return from it that's external but fundamentally your heart is going to be the biggest beneficiary from every act of kindness you interject into the world and you don't want to be the person who can somehow justify especially now that there's somebody out there that looks a certain way comes from a certain place dresses a certain way, believes something, adopts a certain lifestyle that validates you not doing something for them, right? It's the time to be unconditional and to like really give of your light in all directions to anybody who needs it. Absolutely. Well, I just want to add that, you know, Imam uh, Khalid Latif, you may not be a, a medical doctor, but you are uh, a doctor of the heart uh, and a person a leader uh, who influences thousands, if not tens of thousands of people in, in one city, if not hundreds of thousands. So we look upon you as, uh, as, as that, uh, that person who is making the sacrifice mm -hmm. uh, and who is taking risks and then inspiring people to go and give that light uh, to the rest of society. So it's very, very deeply appreciative, especially in Ramadan, especially uh, amidst this pandemic crisis. So we really are grateful for you to be with us today. Absolutely. My, my mother growing up always told me that on the day of judgment, you know, God will not ask you about, you know, everyone else's good deeds or bad deeds. He, he'll ask you about what you did in your time, what you did with your time and your money and your brain and things like that. And I think that this is a notion that your words echo absolutely, that now is not the time to think, you know, 30 years in the future and say, was I on the right side of things? Was I, did I treat people correctly? Give, give, give as much as you can right now because God forbid you are ever on the side of the needy. You know, we want to set a precedent for our communities and, and our future generations. And absolutely, I, I agree with uh, Salam in saying that you are absolutely a, a, a healer of our, of our souls. Um, Imam Khalid, listening to you, I, I'm sure that you hear this all the time, but it's refreshing. It's, 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 uh, it's definitely what we need exactly at the right time. Um, with that being said, I, I sincerely want to thank you on behalf of MPAC for joining us. Um, for those watching live, please um, feel free to share the, the stream as, as much as you want. Um, we will be posting a recorded version on Facebook and on our YouTube channel.
Um, with that being said, I, I encourage all of you to join us tomorrow for our webinar with the cast of Baghdad Central. Um, very exciting show. We're very excited to have them on. Um, as always, you can find information at www.mpac.org forward slash webinars. Um, and keep your questions coming. We really want to uplift some stories on our social media. So please, please reach out. And I hope that we all um, have, have learned some very valid insight um, during this webinar. I know I most certainly have, and we'll be giving quite a few calls to relatives and friends this afternoon. Um, but thank you again, Imam Khalid, and thank have you. a great day. Yeah, thank you. Assalamu alaikum.